الحمد لله رب العالمين العاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه بعد Special brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to First of all, I would like to <coughs> thank Hamim Foundation, Dr. Edward, may Allah preserve him and protect him and um, all his associates for inviting me today to be able to participate in this blessed gathering, Halaqa. Halaqa means a gathering. Literally, Halaqa means to sit in a circle. There's a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, he forbade a tahalluq qabla al-jumu'ah. Some people, when they don't have a deep understanding, and that's what we're talking about today, they interpreted this hadith to say that sitting in a gathering before Salat al-jumu'ah is a bid'ah. It's not allowed, it's forbidden. Therefore, a lecture before Jum'ah prayer is unlawful as per the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He forbade halaqa before Jum'ah. But halaqa in that hadith, if you look at the context, refers to, he actually said to the Sahaba, because what they would do is, before the Jum'ah khutbah, they would sit in small, small circles, five people in a circle, you know, like when you're going to eat, maybe. A small, small halaqa. So they were sitting like that, and he said, Do not sit like that. Everybody sit in a line, in a straight line, not in a circle. Anyway, linguistically, halaqa means to sit in a circle, but metaphorically, it means a gathering. Today's topic is actually a very, very important topic, a very significant topic, and much can be said about this topic, but I've actually chosen to talk about Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala wa radhi anhu in a very specific way and I will need your attention inshallah we hear a lot about Imam Abu Hanifa we hear about his uh, biography, his seerah his biography, his knowledge, his wisdom, his piety much is said, much has been written books and books about Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala wa radhi anhu I want to talk about him from a specific angle and a specific way, a specific part of this great Imam whom the majority of the Ummah follow. The title we have is The Deep Insight. That's the title today. The Deep Insight of Imam Abu Hanifa. Deep Insight <coughs> is a translation of a word in Arabic, Tafakkuh. I'm sure many of you have heard of the word fiqh. From the word fiqh is another word, tafakkuh. Fiqh means to understand deeply. There's two words in Arabic. Fahm means to understand briefly. You, know, you understand something, that's fah. To understand something deeply, the whole context, the ins and outs, what's before it, what's after it, in a very deep sense. Actually, linguistically, when the scholars explain the word fiqh, they say it's like getting to the bottom of something, peeling the skin of a fruit and getting to the root deep inside it. That's what fiqh is. And tafakkuh is somebody who has this ability, this, this deep insight of matters. But I will come to that. But before I mention that, many of you may have heard or you may have read in books that even today this happens, but historically, there was 
some sort of opposition to a, towards this great Imam. And opposition, nobody's free from opposition. Okay, everybody, every people have disagreed and has they've opposed different Imams. Imam Bukhari. If you look at these great great Imams, many of them were persecuted. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, radiallahu anhu, there was whiplashes on him. Imam Bukhari went through lots of uh, trials and tribulations. So you have this opposition. You read in books that people have opposed Imam Abu Hanifa. Some of them said he doesn't know hadith, he does not have knowledge of hadith, or he follows his own opinion, qiyas, he gives preference to his own personal judgments over <coughs> sacred texts of the Quran and Sunnah. Lots has been said and written. <coughs> when we look at all of this, as far as my understanding is concerned, which is from my teachers of course, is that there are basically three main reasons you can conclude all this opposition, not a lot, not all this opposition, some opposition, uh, into three main reasons. How many main reasons? Three. Reason number one, why some people sort of opposed Imam Abu Hanifa in his time and slightly after him and even till today, maybe these tendencies are found today. One reason was many people, when they opposed Imam Abu Hanifa, they opposed him initially because they were unaware of the reality. You know when someone suddenly appears, and he didn't suddenly appear, but somebody who has a sudden name, somebody who is well respected, the whole world is flocking to him, the great Imams are flocking to him. People are spreading his teachings. This is the great Imam who has excelled. He has come out from Kufa. And there's thousands of students. So initially people are taken aback. And when his teachings came out initially, some people, they, you know what, people are normally not ready to accept what's new. Yeah, something new comes up. The first fatwa will be is haram. You know, a few years ago, not a few years ago, many years ago, when the watch came out, the first fatwa was that wearing the watch is haram. Hmm. Then, slowly, slowly, people got used to the idea. Anything new comes up, and this is also, this is not really how it's supposed to be. Anything new comes up, it's haram until it's proven halal. That's not how it's supposed to be. The qa'ida is the nasrul fil ashaya libaha. The basis, the original of everything is it's permissible, and if it's proven to be haram, then it's haram. But anyway. So when Imam Abu Hanifa came uh, with his teachings, his understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, remember it's his understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, it's not his understanding of the Bible or the Torah or the Zabur or the Injil. He's, he's explaining to the people his understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, how he's deducing laws, how he's coming to conclusions, the rules of prayer, the rules of fasting, the rules of zakat, hajj and many other issues. Some people are taken aback. You know, because the way he interpreted the text of the Quran and Sunnah, this is the ruling. Wow, this is some genius guy. How did he come up? Straight away, no, 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 no. Like, this is looking a bit, you know, odd. So, initially, there was a bit of opposition because people, they um, misunderstood him. Uh, they, 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 they did not, what, what reached them was other than the reality. People were not living in the same city and town. We were not living in the time of emails and iPhones and media. Someone's living, living in Baghdad, someone is in Kufa, someone is in Basra, someone is in Sham. And there's, there are examples of some, some great Imams. They initially, they opposed him. And when the reality was uh, exposed to them or shown to them, they actually retracted from their opinion. <coughs> there was this great Imam called Imam Adi bin Hatib. Not, sure, not Hadi bin Hadi, but Imam Adi, Ibn Adi, sorry. Imam Ibn Adi, he has a book called Al Kamil fi Dhu'afa, he's a major scholar of Hadith. Initially, when he heard about Imam Abu Hanifa, he opposed him. He said, Who, What are these teachings this person has come out to? Later, he met the great Imam Al Tahawi, one of the gems of the Hanafi school. This guy is 
Imam al Taha, who's such a great guy, this great Imam, is such that he could have had a madhab on its own. Imam al Taha is one of the gems of this ummah. Seriously, he's a mujtahid. A lot of these people are actually mujtahids, but out of respect, none other than Abu Yusuf and Muhammad, they could have had their own madhabs. But out of respect of their teacher, they did not want to start their own madhabs. That's how much knowledge. Many ulama say that Imam Abu Yusuf, especially, had, was on a par with Imam Abu Hanifa in knowledge. Uh, so Imam al tahawi when he met Imam al tahawi he became a student of Imam al tahawi And then he started realizing and understanding the teachings of Imam Abu Hanifa. He made tawbah, he retracted, and then as a form of expiation, kafara, he gathered all the hadiths of Imam Abu Hanifa in a book, Musnad Abu Abi Hanifa. He said, this is my way of, this is my way of repenting that I spent 10-15 years opposing this great Imam. This is after Imam Abu Hanifa passed away. This is in the 3rd century, the uh, 2nd century. He said, as a way of repenting and expiating, I want to gather all his hadiths and he wrote a book gathered all the hadiths of Imam Abu Hanifa and called it Musnad Abi Hanifa. This is Imam Ibn Adi. There's another Imam called Imam Al-Awza'i. Have you heard of Imam Al-Awza'i? He was from Sham. Sham, specifically in Beirut. And it's still called Beirut. In that time it was called Beirut as well. Imam Al-Awza'i is from Beirut. In Arabic we say Beirut in Lebanon. Right? Some of you may have been there. When I went there, I've been there a few times before when I was studying uh, in Syria for a long time, this long time ago. When I say Syria, I studied a long, long, long time ago. Yes? <laughs> I went there in 2002. I haven't been there since. So when I was studying there, I went. I used to go quite a bit to Beirut, but a couple of years ago, I went with a charity to Beirut. We went to the place where Imam al-Uzai is buried, and, and there's, a, you know, <clears throat> there's a place there. Imam al-Uzai was from the Sham area. <coughs> he once met Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he's a student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Abdullah ibn Mubarak went to Sham, he met Imam al Awza'i. Imam al Awza'i said to him, Man hadha al Rajul al Mubtadi' al Kharij bil Kufa yukanna bi Abi Hanifa. Who's this innovator who's come up with all these new ways of teaching the Quran and Sunnah? Who has emerged in Kufa? <coughs> Abdullah ibn Mubarak said that I did not respond to him at that time. I just Because sometimes you have to use your brains when to you know, sort of respond. You don't just suddenly get a reaction and get angry about something. And, How do you? No, no. Then I just heard and then I left it to that. I went back to the place where I was staying at. And for three days, I gathered all the rulings that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, had gathered, had extracted, deduced from the Quran and Sunnah wrote him down in a small booklet and before those rulings instead of saying qala abu hanifa abu hanifa said i wrote qala qala nu'man ibn thabit <coughs> nu'man bin thabit says if someone says does this 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 then this is the ruling this is from the hadith from the quran sunnah from the quran sunnah. i gathered all of this in three days after three days i went back to manamati and i had these papers he asked me what are these papers i gave it to him it was salah time so he had put it fi kummihi they used to, the early scholars used to have, you know, big, uh, wide sleeves. So because they used to keep, not money, but papers <laughs> and books and things like that. Now we can keep them in our iPads. <laughs> so after Salah, he started reading and he was intrigued. And he kept reading, he couldn't stop reading. The way he told, that these rules were deduced from the Quran Sunnah. And he said to me, Abdullah Mubarak says, he said to me, this, these rules are amazing. Who is this Nu'man bin Thabit? He said, this is the same Abu Hanifa that you asked me three days ago, that who is this innovator who has come out in Kufa? He said, interesting. And then Abdullah ibn Mubarak said, after a few months, Imam Abu Hanifa met Imam al -Uzai. Imam al -Uzai is a mushtahid himself, a great Imam. He met him. And I heard them discussing these same very issues, and Imam al-Uzai was even more intrigued. And when Imam Abu Hanifa left, Abdullah Mubarak is a student of Imam Abu Hanifa. He said, I asked Imam al-Uzai, what, what, what do you think of him? He said, I really envy the man. 
I envy the man because of his excessive knowledge and because of the abundance of intellect. Astaghfirullah. I, I seek the forgiveness of Allah. Laqad kuntu fi ghalatin bahir. I was in apparent <coughs> mistake. Ilzamhu. Stick to the man. Fa'innahu bi khilafi ma balagani. Because he is other than what had reached me before. So he made, and this was the you know, righteousness and piety and, you know, the ikhlas of these people. Today someone opposes and you find out the reality. Like, what will I tell my needs now? It's like I've, I've spent my whole 20 years <laughs> building my reputation built on the opposition. And suddenly the sheikh is, you know, the guy's okay now. So what's happened? You know, they're all going to go there. You know, it's a problem. But the early people there, ikhtilaf and opposition was sincere. And they saw the reality, no problem. Who cares? You know, it was for the sake of Allah. Opposition was for the sake of Allah. There are many examples like that. So that was reason number one. I don't want to go into too many examples, but reason number one why some people disagreed or opposed Imam Hanifa was they did not know the reality. Second reason <coughs> is that like at all times, there's one old spiritual disease that is found in in humans, human beings, which is the disease of jealousy, hasad. Most, if not all, great scholars of this ummah had to face jealousy at some part of their life. Most, if not all, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Malik, and everybody. And sometimes it's sad to say that this jealousy is from other so-called people within the field of knowledge who have not reached Tazkiyah. That's why knowledge without Tazkiyah does not benefit. You fall into spiritual illnesses and diseases. So this was the reason that some people were actually jealous and they started spreading rumors and propaganda against Imam Abu Hanifa. This man, he uh, gives preference to Qiyas and logic over Hadith and look, look, you know, because he, he was <coughs> becoming prominent. Thousands of people are following him. Wherever he's going, people are like, this who? This is an amazing individual. The way he's understanding the Quran and Sunnah. And there are example, uh, stories for that as well. And so this was one of the second reasons. That's why they say, you know, there's a, uh, one of the Imams said, I can't remember who said this, that Hasadul Fata illam yanalu sa'yahu. Hasadul Fata illam yanalu sa'yahu. Kadara il hasna'i. They, they were jealous of the young man because they could not reach his level. Like the co-wives of a beautiful woman, when they say to her face, you're ugly. We don't have co-wives right now. Yet, so <laughs> this example probably doesn't apply. It may, may apply. Kadara'ir al hasnai We have sisters at the back, be careful. Kadara'ir al hasnai Qulna li wajhiha inna hala damimu. They're just jealous. So this was a second reason. Moving on quickly. Third reason, and this is what this talk is supposed to be about. Really. I said all this can be concluded into three reasons. You remember the first reason? Misinformation. Number two, jealousy. Third reason, subhanAllah, this is the main reason. Third main reason is that Imam Abu Hanifa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had given him such an amazing level of intellect, brain, aql, that many people just could not understand him. You know, when you don't understand someone, you just, uh, you know, just oppose them. And this happens in this day and age as well. A lot of times this happens that some people, even some so-called scholars or people, they just... You know, they don't understand the knowledge and, you know, the way someone is saying something. And my limit or my brain or my intellectual limit is very simple. And that's deep. So, yeah, look at the way he's saying, astaghfirullah, this is blasphemy, etc., whatever, whatever. You haven't really understood what the man is trying to say. It's too deep. It, it's too above and beyond your level. This is what happened. And seriously, the aql of Imam Abu Hanifa, Allah had blessed him with a unique aql that even other scholars did not possess. Aql 
is where you have fiqh and tafakkur. Knowledge is one thing, which is memorizing, etc. But aql, lots of people, he just went above them, what he was trying to say, and how he deduced the laws. And this is what you call tafakkur, deep insight. Someone who does not have deep insight will not understand the deep insight. You know, you have to be in the field. You have to be a doctor to understand a doctor. You have to be a faqih to understand a faqih. And this is the deep insight, tafaqquh, which Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah wa radhi anhu had. This tafaqquh, this high level of, uh, this high intellectual level is found or obtained or gained through two ways. One is it's Wahhabi, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you're just born with it or Allah grants you it. We can make dua, of course, but it's granted by Allah. It's not like for every, not not everybody gets that. It's, it's a ni'mah, it's, it's a ni'mah gift from Allah. And number two, this is also acquired by staying for years in the company of somebody of fiqh and tafaqqa. Knowledge is one thing, you can memorize things, you can learn, you can learn this book and that book and this book and that book. But tafaqqa is, is it's, it's unique, you can't even describe it. There's no book to teach tafaqqa. There's no book to teach tafaqqa. <coughs> there are situations, tafaqqa basically means that you have the knowledge but how to apply it, in what context, what to say, when, how, every letter, word, judgments, rulings, being balanced about issues. This is impossible unless someone stays in the company of somebody of tafaqqa and see how they deal with issues. And this is why the Quran talks about tafaqqa, not just knowledge. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ That a group of people should stay back so that they seek deep understanding of knowledge. وَلِيُنذِرُ قَوْمُهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ The hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ I said two ways. <coughs> it's granted by Allah. Hadith says, with whom Allah intends good, Allah gives them this deep understanding of religion. It's, it's granted by Allah. And this of course comes with dua, with piety, etc. This was the third reason that people could not understand Lots of other Imams with all absolute ultimate due respect. And we're not even saying, you know, I mean, we normally say Imam al adham No problem. Lots of people have said this. But I just generally sometimes, it's just me personally, I sometimes tend to avoid using that Imam al adham because we have Shafi'i and Maliki and, you know, we, we live in a place there's different Imams and we respect of everybody. You know, if you just keep on saying Imam al adham the greatest Imam, you know, uh, only Allah knows who's the greatest. And we know, we think he's the greatest. Imam Shafi followers think he's the greatest, so no problem. So in those kind of, you know, mixed gatherings, I just tend to avoid using that. Uh, with absolute, ultimate due respect to a lot of these Imams. But sometimes some of these Imams, they could not even understand Imam Abu Hanifa's intellectual level and his tafakkur. It was just so deep. Some of the rulings that he came, he arrived at. Lots of people looked at the Quranic verse, the hadith, the text, and they, you know, came to conclusion. Imam Abu Hanifa had a different view. Sometimes it's like, if you look at it, apparently, what's what's he saying here? The hadith says this, Bukhari, and Imam Abu Hanifa is completely contradicting it. Now, people today as well, with superficial aqal, superficial knowledge, superficial understanding. We'll say, look, yeah, of course, you know, this hadith saying, and he's saying opposite, and we follow the hadith. But how did Imam Abu Hanifa get to that conclusion? You have to study the whole case scenario. It's very deep. I'll give you one example, and I'll end. But this is what you call tafaqqur. This great, deep understanding of religion. And lots of Imams actually testified. There was a, one of the great Imams of that time, Yazid bin Harun. He said that Adaraktu alfam min ash-shuyukh wa katabtu minhum. I came across thousand shuyukh. I wrote knowledge from them. Fama wajadtu. I did not find anybody. A'lam wa arwa wa afqa min khamsa awaluhum Abu Hanifa. 
I do not find anybody more knowledgeable. Three qualities. These are three amazing qualities. And you'll find these three qualities with Imam Khalifa. I do not find anybody more knowledgeable. Knowledgeable meaning he knows the knowledge. So that's ilm. Okay? No, knows the Quran, Sunnah. That's knowledge. And secondly, nobody more faqih. So knowledge is one thing. If you look at classically, they always separate ilm and fiqh. Knowledge is one thing and fiqh and tafakkul. The insight is something else. Nobody more knowledgeable, more having more insight, and nobody more pious than five people. The leading one of them is Abu Hanifa. Sufyan uh, al-Thawri, or Sufyan bin Uyayna, he also said the same thing, that uh, there's nobody more afdal, more virtuous, more knowledgeable, and more faqih than Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahimahullah ta'ala wa anhu. Lots of Imam. That's why Imam Shafi'i also said, the whole of humanity, people are indebted, indebted to Imam Abu Hanifa in fiqh, his understanding. The way he deduced and extracted laws from the Quran and Sunnah, using his aql and brain. And there's so many like other just examples like, you know, how he, he sort of, you know, there was one incident that just comes to mind. Uh, and then I'll give you that one example and we'll end. But before that one example... You know, there was a man who said to his wife, you know, sometimes you get these kind of incidents, questions that come to people. You know, I don't know what some husbands are thinking sometimes. I don't know. But he said to his wife that if you are not the most beautiful woman on planet Earth, you are divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, sometimes I have so many divorce-related questions. Nearly every week I get about six or seven divorce-related questions. And they're the most difficult ones. <laughs> and the most funny ones as well. People say all sorts. This, this one man said to his wife, I give you four billion and forty-three talaks. I said, why forty-three? Just four billion. <laughs> why did you say the forty-three with it? So this man said to his wife that I, if you are not the most beautiful woman, then you are divorced. Now that's a talaq statement. And the man got scared afterwards. Like people don't think. You know, out of uh, you know that moment, they just say it, and then they start crying. Oh no! Now let's go to this shirk, and is it three talaq or is it two? And now let's go to this imam. Let me let me change madhab now. Now let me just follow Imam Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion, and uh, yeah, three and one is three one. Okay. <laughs> if you are already following it from before, fine, no problem. But you can't, you know, once people start changing these, many ulama say that you know, you're following your desires. It could lead, one day lead you to just leave even Islam altogether. Because this tendency is a bad tendency. So anyway, this is what he said. So he was good. he went to ask a lot of different imams. <clears throat> All the great imams of the time. He said, divorce is done. Sorry. Because if you say, if, if you are the most, if you are not the most beautiful woman. They said, well, you can't, how can you be sure? You know, that you are not the most beautiful woman on planet earth. So therefore, you know, it's. This, uh, this is a matter of nikah and talaq, marriage and divorce. You don't want to live in a haram relationship. Finally, someone said to him, go to Imam Abu Hanifa. He heard his case and he said, if, before I give you the ruling, make tawbah and don't ever say something like this and don't use the word talaq. And he said, it's okay, there's no divorce. Now go home and you know, say sorry to your wife and, and stay on good terms. He said, the reason is, uh, the reason is that sorry I, I made a mistake uh, he didn't say if you are the most beautiful he, he said if you are not more beautiful than the moon sorry that was that's what he said he said if you if you are not more beautiful than the moon then you are divorced so Imam Abu Haifa said that don't worry there's no divorce because your wife is more beautiful than the moon because Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ You have created the human being in the best of forms and modes, which is the best than any creation. So based on this, there's no talaq. There's so many examples like that of Imam Abu Hanifa where, you know, lots of other people, they sort of gave a superficial reply or ruling or judgment. 
And his deep insight, his tafakkur, his fiqh, his understanding was just so amazing, so unique. I'll give you one example and I will end. This is a deeper example of a fiqh issue. I mean, you'll find this in many issues. You know, when we study, sometimes you find in all these rules of, you know, tahara, salah, sawm, zakat, hajj, etc. Okay? That you'll, you'll find sometimes that Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, the amazingly, the way he comes, even even not just to do with fiqh, even before he was in fiqh. I don't want to mention this story, but you probably know of the story. You know that incident with, which happened with atheists? Everybody more or less knows that there was a debate with an atheist. Uh, yeah, lots of people know. Uh, just one minute, I'll shorten it because time we don't have too much time. Uh, the, there was an atheist who denied, of course, Allah. That's why he's an atheist. Uh, and there was a debate fixed. With him. This is before Imam Abu Hanifa went, was in fiqh. Remember, initially he started off his life with, you know, kalam, ilmul kalam, talking about theology and philosophy and kalam and debating aqidah matters. He actually said afterwards that you know, when I left that, I felt better because there was no spirituality in there. You know, I, uh, you know, he he, he did he, he he felt that when he went into hadith and fiqh, then that was really where he felt spirituality. But anyway, in the beginning of his time. Uh, he, 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 in the beginning years, so once there was a big debate and there was a time, this atheist said, you know, I have all the proofs, that I'm going to deny God. And Imam Hanifa, there was, it was a range fixed, the time was fixed, everybody was called, it was a massive debate. Because he used to do a lot of debates. He actually said that I didn't see no benefit in debates. And I'll tell you one thing here, I've heard and I've read many, many scholars, many, not just one, who've spent their lives <coughs> in debates that towards the end of their life, most of them regret, if not all of them. Many, even from the subcontinent and from the Arab world. I've read at least seven or eight different. And many of them, there's one scholar, he, in his 60s, he used to have all his talks based on polemical issues. Like, every talk is about this group or that group or this group or that group or this group. You know, attacking every talk and lecture of his, attacking different groups. Someone needs to do a scholarly work. You do your scholarly work, you present your case and end of story, move on, you know. The great scholars, that's what they do. They tackle all these issues, but they do it in a scholarly way. They write a book, they finish the subject, they move on. And if there's a time for that, well, they give it. That's it. But some people, their whole lives revolve around just polemical issues. He came into his 60s, and then he just, last 10, 15 years of his life, he passed away. He spent on tazkiyah and spirituality and building, you know, people's iman and all of that. And he said, honestly, I think I've wasted my 60, you know, 40, 50 years of my life just dealing with these kind of issues. There's no benefit. Nobody's, you know. Because when you start arguing and debating, debates never do anything. Never. Debates never benefit and they don't convince people. Because people already want to argue and fight about it. That's why, you know, these debates and all that, you know, many of my teachers are still <coughs> far away from debates. Well, why do you want to debate on these issues? There's no, there's no benefit in debating. So Imam Abu Hanifa, same thing, in the beginning he was used to debate, even with atheists. So he had a, this debate, it was arranged, fixed, lots of people were, came. The time had come at the, on the day, at this time, everybody had gathered, the atheist and all his crew and everybody's there. Imam Abu Hanifa hasn't arrived yet. His followers, students are looking, oh no, what's happened, the Imam is still not here. What's happened, what's happened? Those people started rejoicing, yes, yeah, see, we, you know, we've won, yeah, your, your Imam, you know, it's just, you know, it's just... He just talks, that's it, you know, where is he? And they were just about to all go and, you know, claim victory. Suddenly they saw the Imam appearing and he came. So, uh, when he came, they, everybody sat down. So the atheist said to, the, uh, to Imam Hanifa, that, before we start, look, you're late. Explain why you're late. Forget, you know, we'll talk about our discussion about the existence of God. But why have we come late? Imam Hanifa said, actually, sorry, sorry, I'm really sorry. But what happened was, I was coming, and then I had to walk. And when I was walking, there was a, a river came. Uh, you know, and there were no boats. I had to cross a small river to come here. And suddenly, I was just waiting, waiting, and I got late. And then there was a tree next to the river. It suddenly snapped, and the tree fell down. And, and the wood planks off the tree, suddenly, they all started moving by themselves. And... Suddenly, like, they all got together and miraculously they all joined and became a boat. 
and he came next to me. I hopped into it, and then I just sat there, and the boat by itself took me on the other side of the river, and I crossed it, and I came rushing from there, and I've just come, so I'm sorry, that's one bit. So the atheists start laughing, what is people? <laughs> What's wrong with this guy? Have you ever... Is this guy has lost his brains or something? Have you seen anybody, you know, any boat just all falling down and this he's just making it up? Can it something a boat be, you know be made by itself? Imam Abu Hanifa said, if a small boat can't be made by itself, how come this whole existence and creation come into existence by itself? <laughs> and the debate was won before it even started. There's numerous examples like this. But in fiqh, if you look at all these rules I was saying, and I'm going to end with this, that when we study the different issues of fiqh, we see that sometimes, because you know you find in different issues that Imam Shafi'i and Imam Malik is on one side, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Ahmed has another opinion, or these three, two Imams here, there are some cases where everybody has gone to one side. Everybody has left Imam Abu Hanifa, he's alone. A lot of people feel intimidated, or oh, inferior, there's an inferiority complex here that uh, Shafi'i, Malik, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and all Al Zai, and, and Sufyan al Thawri, and everybody, Ishaq bin Rahuya, all the Imams, they've taken one position, Imam Abu Hanifa is alone. But seriously, I tell you, those are the times where Imam Abu Hanifa is at the strongest position, like it's very deep, it's very solid. Like, you know, um, many issues, like reciting behind Imam. Like now, reciting behind Imam in prayer. Lots of others, they saw a hadith. La salata illa bi fatihat al kitab. La salata liman lam yaqra bi fatihat al kitab. The one who does not recite fatiha, his salah is invalid. Hadith of Bukhari, Sahih, brother Akhi, there's a you know, translation. Chapter this, volume number this, translation this, narrated. The one who does not recite fatiha, salah is invalid. What does Imam Abu Hanifa say? It's makru tahrim to pray behind the Imam. What's going on, Imam Abu Hanifa? قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا صلاة إلا بفاتحة الكتاب قال أبو حنيفة يكره تحريما it's مكره تحريما who would you follow the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or Imam Hanif of course of course the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم but this sort of argument apparently makes sense to those people who whose intellectual level is limited Imam Abu Hanif his تفقه he goes deep he doesn't look at the fruit from the top he peels the skin he cuts it open. He goes. He takes some microscope or whatever. He goes deep inside, and he sees those atoms and those things with his microscopic, you know, what, what do you call it, Mic yeah. microscope, whatever. And he sees those atoms or those, you know, things that others don't have that microscope. He looked at the issue, and I don't have the time to go into it. This is a scholarly kind of discussion, but uh, how he came to that. He has his own methodology that there are verses of the Quran which are qatbi, which are absolute, and then hadiths are dhanni, which are probable. The verses of the Quran, there's no doubt. Therefore, he gives preference to that over hadiths. Now, there's verses of the Quran like Wa al Quran When the Quran is being recited, remain, listen to it attentively, and if you can't listen to it, then remain quiet, even if in, when the Imam is praying silently. This is a Quranic verse, this is Qat'i, this is absolute, it's categorical. This is the main text. This is the main, this is the boss text. The hadith is Khabar Wahid, which is uh, Dhanni, which is probable. So you act upon the hadith in light of the boss, the main text. We don't act on the hadith in, in a way that uh, undermines the, the verse of the Quran. The Quran is saying, when the Quran is being recited, listen attentively. So therefore, the Imam says that look, we we will make if you're if you're praying in behind. This is very in a simple way of explaining it. There's so much other things related to it. But if you list, if you if you are in salah and you, the Imam is reciting, then you listen to it, and the Hadith is referring to when someone is praying on their own because you're not praying behind the Imam. Then, if you don't of, uh, recite Surah Al-Fatiha, your salah is not done. And then he has also Hadiths, other Hadiths. I will tell you one more example. This is the main example, and then we'll end. There's a hadith in chapter of business transactions. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-mutabayyani bil-khiyari ma lam yatafarraqa. 
the two transacting people, buyer and seller, they have an option. They have an option to cancel the transaction or to choose it. It's the famous hadith, Sahih. Yes, like brother would say, Sahih hadith. Sahih, it's absolutely rigorously authenticated Sahih hadith. <laughs> like the La Salata illa bi Fatih al Kitab. It's a Sahih hadith. But then Imam Abu Hanif has got a Sahih ayah as well from the Quran. You know, somebody brings a hadith, Imam Abu Hanif can bring the ayah of the Quran. Like brother, hadith, brother, Quran ayah. What's happening? Anyway, so this is an absolutely authentic hadith. <coughs> when you two are buying and selling, you have an option to cancel it. You've sold something to him and he's bought it. The hadith is clearly saying, clear. If you look at it, apparently, you have an option to cancel as long as you don't separate. So you've done the transaction, you're still here sitting, you know, now you're having coffee, tea, etc. Suddenly, you know, you get a text and you look at your phone and your wife says, you need to take me out somewhere today, you need to buy me this. And you think, oh no, I haven't got money. I have brothers, forget it, I don't want to, just, I don't want to buy it. Just got a text from the wife. So you have a right to cancel it. Even though this guy made all the arrangements, he's already told his wife that, you know, I've already bought that item for, you know, I've done the transaction. Or they choose it, like one of them says, okay, chosen. You, you, as long as you don't separate, like if you separate, you go outside, then you can't come back and say, sorry, you know, I just got a phone call. No, now it's done. This is the clear message of the hadith. And this is the opinion of Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, and everybody, they say this is the ruling is based on the clear hadith. Imam Abu Hanifa, radiallahu anhu, he says, no. Sorry. When two people, they conclude their sale, you do the ijab and qabul, you buy and sell, you finish. No one party has a choice to cancel it. You can't say, sorry, I've changed my mind. I don't want to buy it anymore. You can't say, sorry, I don't want to sell it. Give it back to me. He says, take your money. You can't do that. <laughs> totally opposing. Like it's a clear hadith, completely opposing it. Now, how did you oppose it? Opposing it, it's not really opposing it. You know, we call it opposing it. It's actually acting on the hadith with fiqh. It's not opposing. It's actually acting on the hadith with fiqh, with a deeper insight. Imam Abu Hanifa said, look, there's numerous texts of the Quran and Sunnah that point out to the right of the buyer and the seller. Once it's done, then this is, has to be taken very, very seriously. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu awfu bil aqood All you who believe when aqd transaction is done you have to complete it like when it's done you have to let it, you can't just if someone you know, out of will say okay please can you cancel it you know then that's fine you know, that's actually quite rewarding if someone you see that is but it's your choice the quran also says ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil illa an takuna tijaratan an tarad or you who believe don't consume wealth unlawfully unless it's a transaction which is of which is with mutual consent. So if you've already done the transaction, now it's basically reversing it. You want to cancel it, but he doesn't want to. It's no mutual consent. It's going against that verse. There's approximately about eight, nine verses that he says it goes against it. All of them. That's number one. Number two, this particular hadith, the two people transacting have a right to cancel as long as they don't separate. Imam Abu Hanifa says, you've misunderstood this hadith. The wording is al mutabayani The two transacting people. It's actually the seller and the buyer. The basic translation, apparent translation would be the buyer and the seller. But if you look at the wording properly, mutabayi' or in another narration is bayi'ani is the one who is in the process of buying and the one in the process of selling. So the hadith means the two people in the process of selling and buying, they haven't concluded the sale yet, have a right. So you're still talking, you're looking at the iPhone, yeah, yeah, it's good, is it six, iPhone, five, does it sound good, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And you say, yeah, I'm selling. And then suddenly you say, oh, brother, forget it. I don't want to carry on with the conversation, just leave it, forget it, I've changed my mind. No problem. 
You can do that. You haven't concluded the ijab and qabul yet. So the buyer and the seller, in the process of buying and selling, they have an option. Bil khiyar. As long as they don't separate, meaning as long as they don't separate from the wording, tafarruq bil aqwal. There's two, the tafarruq bil abdan. The other imam said, as long as they don't physically separate, Imam Abu Hanifa is saying, no, as long as they don't separate verbally, like, they don't separate by saying, ijab, qabul, done, like, I've bought, I've sold, and they don't separate from that. And this is, and, this, and then he brings many verses of the Quran again to show that this, ma lam yatafarraqa, when the two separate, there's many, many verses in the Quran, when this word has been used, it's with separation with the tongue, not physically. Phys not physical separation. It's talking about separation with words. Basically, they haven't separated by saying, I've accepted, I've sold you a boat, and they haven't separated from the same. They're still talking. And there's about another five verses which, which show that the meaning of tafarruq in the Quran is separating by words and not physically. And this is just, I've given you like a summary. Yeah? This issue is like, there's about 10, 15 pages of this issue. It's just an absolute summary of what I'm remembering right now, and I probably forgot a lot myself. And just imagine, this insight of Imam Abu Hanifa has really helped people today. To act upon the Shafi'i Maliki Hanbali, right, in this day and age. Imagine, because these people, oh, the other Imams, and they've actually then debated that what will happen? What will happen? Okay, people, if they're both physically there, but nowadays, trade is so different. Like one person's on the other side of the world in Japan on the phone, and this guy's in London. He's on the other phone. Okay? And they've concluded the same. And then one of them says, No, I don't want to carry on. Some Imam, some currently scholars, they said, from the Shafi'i Malikis, they said, Okay, as long as the phone receiver's on, you can. You know, you can cancel it. You've done the business transaction, then you're talking about, you know, everything else, you know, house life, etc. And before you put the phone down, say, okay, by the way, I'm canceling that. They say, it's okay. All right, what about if it's not phone calls? What about if it's an email? Like, you, you send an email, I'm sending you this. The other one says, okay, I accept it, done, deal, done, everything done. And there's been cases. Imagine, you do the deal, and the other person then sends the goods, and the person who receives the goods, they say, I don't want it because I canceled it. When you didn't tell me, well, when you I sent you the email, but I was still in the gathering, I was still there, and you know I told my my colleagues, my secretary, I told him, listen, be be a, you know a witness. I do, I am overturning this sale. I don't want it. Endless disputes, endless disputes. It just goes against the spirit of Sharia. When something's done, you, you stay to your word, and you're done because there's so many verses of the Quran. The Quran also says, When you buy and sell, make witnesses. Yeah? When you buy and sell, it's recommended, have two witnesses. Okay? Imagine you do the buying and selling, you made us two witnesses, and then me and him, we went away. And then suddenly one of you cancelled, so what's the witnesses going to, you know, what's the point of, of making witnesses? The Quran says make witnesses, but then if you can, after half an hour of chatting, just cancel it, then what's the point in having witnesses? Etc. 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 And there's so much other things can be said, but this was the depth and the insight and the tafakkur and the fiqh of this great Imam Abu Hanifa radiAllahu taala anhu. And this is the third main reason. People, first reason was misinformation. Number two, jealousy. Number three was his tafakkur and his fiqh and his aql that some people just couldn't understand where he was coming from because it was just too much. It was above their level. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate the rank of this great and give us the tawfiq to make dua for him and follow, try to follow his footsteps.